Oh, there we go. We're now live. So I'm going to say welcome everyone and to our EMS meeting. And I will begin by asking for a mover and seconder for the agenda. Kathy. Uh, Kathy and Irene that the June 16th, 2021 Perry Sound District Emergency Medical Services Committee meeting agenda be approved. Anyone opposed to that? Nope. Okay, that's carried. Any disclosure of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof? No, I don't see anybody doing that. So now I need a mover and seconder for the minutes. Rod and Scott. With the minutes of uh, November 18th, 2021 meeting of the Perry Sound District Emergency Medical Services Committee be approved as circulated. Any discussion on those minutes? Nope. Okay, anyone opposed to the passing of those minutes? I don't see anyone opposed, so that's carried. Uh, correspondence. Okay, through you, Mr. Chairperson, we do have two uh, pieces of correspondence received. Both are uh, letters from um, McKellar Township. The first is dated December 9th, 2020, and it's with regards to um, them um, providing payment for the supplemental EMS levy. The other piece of uh, correspondence was received May 18th. That's 3.2 on your agenda, uh, 2021. And uh, it is uh, requesting um, three, uh, three things. I'm sorry, bear with me while I get to that, that piece. Uh, they are um, concerned about uh, budget increases. Uh, they are concerned about the supplemental levy and they're also concerned about um, representation on the committee. So you've received those uh, pieces of correspondence and uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have or, or whatever you would like. Anyone have any questions with regard to the correspondence? Uh, Rod? Uh, thank you. Through you, Chair. Uh, Dave, have you had any personal conversations with staff out there or council on these resolutions? Through you, uh, Mr. Chairperson, I did participate in a McKellar Township Council meeting in November or December with regards to the supplemental levy. They had requested that I tend to uh, I tend to explain that we did actually talk about a number of these items and issues at that meeting. And I would suggest that I provided the, uh, the answers that uh, everyone here is well aware of with regards to the supplemental levy. Uh, I did discuss uh, increasing costs for EMS services. And we did discuss the committee makeup and the need for McKellar to, you know, work collectively with their partners to get uh, representation on the committee. Uh, there were also discussion with regards to the movement of information to them and uh, things that we could do here on the town's end. Uh, part of that tonight would be the setting of a uh, regular meeting schedule so there can be a better flow of standard uh, information to all municipal uh, municipalities, actually not just McKellar, to all of them uh, in, into the future, as well as providing uh, the committee members a more standardized approach to our schedule. So th Thank those... You, uh, just on one, one point, uh, the fair representation, has McKellar ever specifically been represented on EMS as, a, as an individual municipality? Through you, Mr. Chairperson, the since I have been involved with EMS as well as dating back to when Don Brisbane uh, and and the town took over the service uh, back in between what it was 2000 and 2002, the makeup of the committee has always been the same. So McKellar does have representation on the committee. It uh, they are represented with a group of four municipalities, being Carling. 
McDougall, Whitestone, and McKellar. Those municipalities uh, do choose amongst themselves a representative, similar to how some of the other representatives are uh, picked and chosen to be on this committee. The, the two exceptions would be Seguin and the Archipelago. Everyone else is a collective of municipalities. So since I've been involved, um, I don't know that there has actually been a representative from McKellar. However, we have always received a resolution that they do support the representative for the collection of four municipalities. And who is that right now, Dave? Right now, that would be uh, Councillor Mallott. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember. Uh, usually it's been either McDougal or Carling that's yeah, never been that representative um, yeah. representing that area. So I guess, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I, I guess you somehow this committee needs to respond to that item and determine whether or not we have a look at representation again uh, to, in someone's eyes, make it more fair. I don't think we can ignore that. I mean, it sounds like there's a little bit of confusion as to who's representing what when, and maybe it, it is worthwhile looking at. It's my opinion. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, to be to be honest, to be honest, this is an advisory committee, and the town of Perry Sound doesn't have to have an advisory committee. No. Um, but we chose to have one, um, and this representation way of representation seemed the best way. Either that, or all of a sudden it breaks it out to even more members. Uh, from different areas and the committee becomes much larger and sometimes more awkward to handle. Um, I think it's important that that representatives do share information. I'm on the public health board and I feed information to uh, the local mayors and our council all the time, the, the people that I'm representing to make sure that they know, uh, they get the information that I do. So. I think that's important. Uh, Louis. Yes, um, I got um, reappointed to council when Kim Dixon left to take the building department thing. Uh, that was at the start of COVID. Um, that I haven't been to any McKellar meetings. Last meeting we had is, was November. So I'm coming in this totally green. So I take at least partial responsibility because I haven't done anything to them because I know nothing yet. So. Um, you know, I did talk to the CAO, um, an acting CAO, before explaining that to them. They seemed it was okay with it. Um, I understand their frustration. Yeah, they haven't heard a word from me because I haven't had anything to say. So, yes, they have had no representation, but only because of that. So, um, if they're watching, my apologies. But um, this is the first real meeting we've had since November, and that was my first meeting. So, it was like trying to stand... Pythagorean and Syria in grade one. I had no idea what this was all about. So yeah. Fair enough. that's all I can say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Dave. Um, I would like to, uh, for some of the members who haven't been on for more than uh, recently, we did address, we did assess uh, representation and um, committee makeup uh, approximately three years ago. Um, Rod, you would have been on then, and Kathy, I think, would have been on at that time. Or maybe it was Barb, I'm sorry. Um, however, at that time, the committee was very strong in their support of the system that we had in place. So um, we have talked about that in the recent history. Yeah. Yeah. So... Do you want a letter to go back to them about this then? Is that? Are you requesting that, Rod? Oh, uh, sorry. I, I think it would it would be appropriate to respond and explain um, the whys and wherefores and the fact that this is only an advisory committee to the town of Perry Sound. And, and, and as Dave had mentioned, uh, the fact that it's been reviewed not that long ago. I think it's appropriate to at least respond, yes. Okay. You good with that, Dave? 
Certainly. Okay. Right. Any other comments on correspondence? No? Okay. Uh, deputations, Frank, welcome. Hello, everyone. So, <clears throat> Lyle Hall is trying to get back into the meeting. I'm going to admit him. Well, thanks for the opportunity to um, to meet and speak with you tonight. Um, Dave's asked me to highlight some of the stuff that we've done as a result of the pandemic, and I wanted to give everybody a clear understanding about our community paramedic program and, and what it is and all of the different programs within that. And um, it's nice to know that some of you are fairly new because it allows me to scale my presentation to that. So um, we've had a community paramedic program for about six years in our service, and it has fit very well with our day-to-day -day operations, although it's somewhat different. And the community paramedic program in its infancy was geared at reducing 911 calls and emergency visits. So we looked at our frequent users and we would reach out and contact them to see if we could visit with them and look to see if there was any supports that we could offer them to kind of keep them at home more and reduce the number of hospital visits. And this was being done in many areas around the province at the time. I would guess probably at the time, probably 15 or 20 different um, paramedic services were looking at or doing community paramedicine. <clears throat> It's the non-emergent side of our business. So community paramedicine is intended to support our seniors and vulnerable population in their home to reduce their dependency on the healthcare system. So it's, it's grown in the last six years. It started out as one full-time person. It now employs seven people full-time. And as many of you know, we've opened two new offices, one in Humphrey and one in Powassan at the fire stations. And we've purchased some new vehicles as a result of getting the funding from the um, Ministry of Long-Term Care. And I'm happy to say that this is the first time that we've received funding through the Ministry of Long-Term Care for anything. Um, traditionally, as most of you know, it's, it's flowed through the Ministry of Health. And at one point, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Long-Term Care were one, but it was really coming through the Ministry of Health. This is a, a brand new opportunity that was specific to services that had community paramedic programs existing. And we were one of those. So we were very fortunate to be, to be offered that. So the community paramedic program, um, those employed in it are paramedics. They're people that work and function daily as paramedics. And they've expressed an interest to go to this side of the, pro the service, which is a less emergent side. And it allows them the opportunity to create relationships and friendships with the clients in the program. And that's something that as a paramedic, you don't get to do. Um, as Kathy knows, we spend very little time with these people and any conversations tend to be around emergent conversations of specifically what's wrong with them and what their complaints are. So we're in and out of people's lives quickly. And this program allows us the opportunity to go into somebody's home and spend some time and form relationships and it's been very well received by our staff and in particular, some of our senior staff. And it's, uh, it gives them a, a kind of a new lease on their job and a certain amount of personal satisfaction comes with working in this field. So um, that's something that I wanted to make clear that everybody knew that these, these people are not just equally qualified, but they're actually more qualified than the majority of our staff because of the extra skills that they take on. Um, Dave, if you would screen share with me or do I have that now? So I've given you that uh, already, you're co-hosting. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Not, Not yet, there. Frank. There we go. Okay. Yep. So, <clears throat> I'll start off by talking a little bit about our program and I have this slideshow that I put together just so I don't get off track and um, <laughs> reminds me of all the different things that I wanted to talk to you about but it's very much a, a patient centered program and it's very unique to each individual so the services within our program not everybody um, 
would want or need all of those services. But uh, our community paramedics often in consultation with the family physicians determine what services um, would benefit each individual person. So <clears throat> the objectives is to improve the quality of life um, to the citizens in our district and to be that bridge that gap that closes the gap in healthcare so that these people have um, somebody in their corner supporting their, their health. So we do this a number of ways and I'm gonna get to talking about all of the different things that we do. Um, but it's, uh, we use the term, it's a safety net. It is a safety net. It's, it supports primarily geriatric uh, populations, but it also supports um, people with mental health issues as well. And it doesn't have an age requirement. Um, you know, they don't have to be above 65 to, to, to be enrolled in the program, um, but um, it tends to be that population or that demographic that we do support more than, than some of the others. Um, some of the things we do, as you can see here, is home visits and telephone visits. So <clears throat> this um, is done primarily through referrals and we receive referrals for these clients often from uh, family health teams, hospital discharge planners, uh, home and community care in the Lynn, as well as our paramedic staff themselves. So our paramedics might go into a home and take someone to hospital that they think would benefit from being enrolled in our program. And they will send a referral to our community paramedic team. And the community paramedics, once they receive this referral from whatever source it comes from, they, have a, they call the person and have a visit over the telephone to schedule an appointment in their home so that they can come into their home, explain more and demonstrate more about what the program's about. And during that home visit, there's a, a number of things that they're going to do and see if, first of all, the person's interested, if it's if we offer services that would work and fit for this person, and as well as if they really truly need those supports and determine a frequency for any follow-up visits. So is the frequency gonna be once a month, once a week? Um, often when we first start out, it can be you know every few days that we're either calling or doing home visits with some of these people. So <clears throat> here's some of the things that we do and I'll, I, it's kind of a broken up list, but I'm gonna start by talking about the home visits. So we're, when we're in someone's home doing the initial visit, um, one of the things that we look at is the safety features within the home. And, and part of what we're looking at is aiming to reduce the incidence of falls. And uh, falls can be a very detrimental injury to a senior. And they're very expensive to the healthcare system. And they can be life-changing for these people. And, and often they live in these homes and they've lived in them for many years and they can become cluttered or, you know, they haven't noticed some of the risks so it might be things like a loose rug, uh, it might be stairs, uh, it could be clutter, it could be a number of things. But we look for trip hazards that would cause falls. Um, we look to make sure that they have food accessible in their fridge and that they have means of preparing that food and that they're able to provide themselves with the other necessities of life, like they have you know, water and the ability to bathe. And we do a medication compliance check. So we look at the medications that they're prescribed. We do account to make sure that they're taking the medications the way that they're prescribed. And this visit typically takes anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. And during that time, we talk about our program and we explain to them what we can offer and the fact that enrollment is free. So it doesn't cost them anything. Um, <clears throat> so that's the initial home visit. And it's followed up if they don't want a frequent home visit and often they just want us to touch base, we'll, we can do a weekly telephone check where we call them, check to see how they're making out and see if they need a visit or if they want to schedule a visit. Um, another thing that we do, and I'll jump through this a little bit, is we do point of care INR testing. And what that is, is people that are on blood thinners have to go and have their blood viscosity checked frequently to make sure that the right dose of blood thinners is, is working for them. So they would typically go to the lab and have blood drawn for this. We have a device that we can go to their home, we pick their finger, and within less than a minute, we're able to measure their blood viscosity. And 
you know, we're not trying to do this for everybody and this program is not about duplicating services that exist. This is about supporting people that wouldn't otherwise get this done. And the importance of this test is something that if we can keep their blood viscosity within the acceptable ranges, we reduce their likelihood of clots and strokes and heart attacks and all of that, as well as we reduce their likelihood that their blood has become too thin and they could develop a bleeding disorder. So it's a necessary part of what we do. Um, we do this in the home and we do it on referral from family physicians. The information that we get, we get instantly and we share with the coagulation clinic as well as the family physicians. We do other immunizations, one of which is seasonal influenza. And uh, last year we administered just over 350 seasonal influenza vaccines in the home. And I mean, we believe the that doing that is very important. Again, we're looking at a demographic that isn't able to get out to clinics. So we're ensuring that they're protected um, as well as can be from seasonal influenza, which uh, with this, uh, this population can be pretty detrimental. Um, talked about the medication compliance. We support some people in terms of mental health and we work um, with Canadian Mental Health Association and, and other um, groups to try and refer them to services when we feel that they would benefit from it. And we have not a, a large population of the clients that we serve, but we, we do have a good number. And what we've seen through the pandemic is that the people requiring mental health supports, that number has increased. Um, part of that comes because this group that we're serving suffered greatly with social isolation during the pandemic and, and really just not getting out and talking with people has led to mental health issues like depression and that kind of thing. So these home visits that we do serve more purpose than just the, the things that I talked about. It gives them an opportunity to have somebody to talk to for a few minutes. And uh, that in these times has a value. That's, uh, that's something that, that we've found is, is pretty important. And these people look forward to these visits. Now, we book these home visits similar to the way Bell Canada books your um, maintenance. And we say, we'll be there within this time and this time and we don't pinpoint an exact time. And one of the reasons we do that is because all of our community paramedics that are out on the road are in marked vehicles and those vehicles have AVL tracking devices on them. So we know right where they are at all times. And so does dispatch. So that when our community paramedics are close to an emergency call, we reroute them to that call to stop the clock. Because if you don't know already, you will find out um, as being part of this committee, uh, that our times are a very important part of what we do and, and answering for our response times. And if we can have these community paramedics stop the clock and administer care before an ambulance arrives, that works very well for us um, to reduce our response times. And we've had instances where they were in a remote part of the district and they were able to, they were within a minute or two of a call, able to get to that call, stop the clock, administer life-saving care, and the helicopter, Orange, uh, was able to land close to the scene, transport the individual to the hospital, and they were being loaded into the helicopter as our transport ambulance was arriving on scene. So just to put things into perspective of how quick that can happen, when the stars align like this, that we're able to stop the clock and have Orange come, that person gets definitive care in a pretty timely fashion. And when you live in some of our more remote parts of the district, that's a, that's a quite an achievement. So that's another thing that our community paramedics are doing is they're out there responding to these. Um, I'm going to talk a lot, as you can tell. If anyone has a question, you can either raise your hand or just interrupt me and I will uh, I'll respond to any mm -hmm. questions you might have. So um, I'm gonna now, I guess, move to talking about Sorry, do we have a question? Oh. Um, I'm gonna to move to talking about the part of our community paramedicine um, program that is, I call it sort of our flagship and that's our ideal life remote monitoring for patients. Oh, before I do, I'll show you one example. Um, <laughs> wow. So this is, I wanted to take a picture. This, was, this is one of the home visits that I was on. Uh, we try not to send our community paramedics into a home alone the first time and we try to send another staff member with them. And often that's myself or one of the supervisors because that's you know what we, what we have available. And I was on this, this particular visit um, and this was our first visit. And when we saw this, we knew there was no way that we could leave this individual with 
what you see in this picture. Um, so we explained that it was incumbent on us to contact the local fire service and have them come by. And it wasn't a matter of just tidying up for this person. Um, we feared that if he didn't get the proper message that, you know, the next time we come back, this would potentially be looking like this again. And so the fire service come and dealt with this and found some other, um, you know, things that needed attention and sat down and did some education with the person and stressed the importance of this because this is in uh, an area that other, there's other units attached to this unit that this individual lives in and a fire in this area wouldn't just affect one individual. This could have been, you know, devastating, but it's, it's an idea of what our, our paramedics do see in, in some of the homes that they go to. And, you know, it's part of our home safety check. Once we've seen this, there's no way that we can leave this. So it's, it's one of the things that we do. So um, Ideal Life Remote Monitoring, this is, um, this is a really cool program. And I'm going to take a few minutes to explain it because it, it's, it's such a, a neat program. So we have this program where we put these devices into people's homes and they basically electronically monitor people's health. And it's a partnership we, we have um, with Future Health Services. And when we started this, it was part of a Queen's University study to see if this form of remote monitoring for people's health conditions would be a cost-effective way of monitoring people's health and reduce the number of visits to hospitals and stuff. So we target people that have usually two com comorbidities. So congestive uh, or COPD, congestive heart failure, diabetes, these are some of the more common ones that would we would place this equipment for. And most recently, we received funding to support those with COVID-19 in their home that have been diagnosed and um, was sick, but not so sick that they had to be in hospital or to keep them out of hospital should the capacity of the hospital become a problem, we would be able to support these people in their homes. And during the second wave of COVID-19, we did do this. In fact, we supported a number of people within the district. Luckily, we didn't get the numbers that was anticipated, but it did prove to be very beneficial. And uh, so this is, this is kind of, I'll talk now about some of the devices. So we visit the home and we install devices depending on what their medical, um, their diabetes or their uh, medical conditions are, can depend on which devices we leave. But the devices that are available are a weigh scale, a glucometer, a pulse oximeter. And what a pulse oximeter is, it's a thing that goes over your finger. It measures your oxygen concentration and it bas basically um, confirms that your lungs are functioning the way that they should by putting oxygen into the bloodstream. Um, a pulse, uh, sorry, a blood pressure machine is another device. And we have up and coming a falls prediction device. And it's an accelerometer that's a pendant that will go around the individual's neck and they'll wear this when they walk around their home. And the purpose of all of this equipment is it takes readings and it transmits those readings to a profile that we have created for each individual person. So we install a pod in their home and it uses primarily Wi-Fi to transmit when they take these, use these devices, it instantly sends those readings to the profile. And we set parameters for each individual so that if they gain or lose weight, if their heart rate's up or down, their blood pressure's increased or decreased, all of these things, then it sends an alert to our community paramedics. So for instance, the weigh scale isn't about managing their weight. The weigh scale is for people with congestive heart failure, where one of the early signs is that they start to retain fluid. And when that fluid fills their lungs, they're pretty sick and they end up in the hospital. The goal of this is to head that off. Sorry, do you have a question, Rob? Did I? Yes. No, not yet. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so the weigh scale alerts us that they're starting to accumulate fluid and we'll see that, you know, we'll see changes in the pulse oximetry reading that their oxygen saturation levels are dropping and, and it'll give an early indication that maybe their congestive heart failure is starting to act up. When this happens and we get an alert, so the weigh scale, for instance, we set an alert that if they gain or lose two pounds uh, within 24 hours, that sends us an alert. We'll contact them. And with each of these devices, we have a different series of questions we ask to eliminate a potential mistake that could have occurred. So with the weigh scale, 
Um, did they get weighed at the same time they would typically get weighed? Did they eat before they got weighed? Are they wearing more clothing than they would normally wear? Um, we do this kind of troubleshooting over the phone. And when we're finished, we ask them to take another measurement. And if we start to see that these measurements are indicating that they're starting to get ill, then we'll have a home visit with them that day and assess their need for further medical attention. And often, not often, but often enough, this will get escalated to a 911 call. And I know our program is about reducing the 911 calls, but if we can get somebody to hospital for treatment before they're so sick with some of these conditions like congestive heart failure, we're reducing the number of days that they're spending in a hospital and ultimately saving the healthcare system dollars. So even if they're so sick that they need to be hospitalized, we're catching these things much earlier than if they didn't have it. I'm going to say that as well, um, the reaction from people when we call them and say, we received an alert, um, you know, your heart rate's up higher than it should be. We want you to sit. What were you doing before you took your reading? Did you go up the stairs? Or we want you to sit for two minutes and take the reading again. And the fact that we know these things gives people the reassurance and often people sit at home, particularly those that are alone, questioning their own health. And, you know, they're going, geez, I, am I short of breath? I, I don't know if I feel well. Do I need to call 911? And that was the sort of the, the group that we targeted with this program initially because they knew they were getting supports and somebody was watching their health. And before they got sick, we knew they were getting sick. And so it worked very well to reassure people that somebody's looking after their health. Now, the other thing, I mentioned the profile that we create, it's much like a Facebook profile in that we have all of their past medical history, the medications they're on, any allergies they have, all that information. And we can share all of these readings electronically with their family physician or any specialist that wants to see them. And often for things like blood pressure medications, they'll want to monitor changes to their blood pressure daily for three weeks or a month. And we're able to send them that information and they can make those adjustments much more accurately. But the other thing we can do is we can share, provided the, the individual uh, consents, we can share this with anyone outside of that circle of care as well. And one, um, one story that comes to mind is one of our clients had a daughter that was a nurse in British Columbia. And the daughter wanted to know about her, um, her mother's health. And we were able to share these readings with her. And every day she could get up, go to the computer and look and see what her mother's blood pressure was and all of those things. So it's, uh, it's pretty unique and it's a great program. It, it costs us $70 a month to enroll people in this program. And the goal is that we put them in for six months to a year and we teach them and how to better educate or how to better manage their, their illness. So, you know, sometimes it's about compliance with medications. People that have congestive heart failure take water pills to eliminate that fluid and they don't want to take them because it causes them to run to the bathroom too much. And, and we educate them on the need to take those medications. And, you know, it might be a, a diabetic with a glucometer that we're monitoring and we teach them about, you can't eat that big slice of pie for dessert for three meals a day. I mean, a lot comes from this and our community paramedics sit down and do this education with them with the goal of getting these people off of this and living a healthier and more independent life at home. So it's a, it's a pretty cool program. We're, we're pretty proud to be participating in it. And through all of our funding avenues, well, not all, but most of our funding avenues, one of the key things is we have this as part of our program because this is a service that we want or that the Ministry of Long-Term Care wanted us to be able to provide to those that are on the wait list for long-term care placement so that they're being, their health is being monitored closely even while they're at home. So it's a key element to our community paramedic program. So the bottom, uh, the bottom section talks about it transmits it wirelessly. Um, it's, it, it works very well. Um, it works best with internet connections. And I know our provincial government, I met today with Norm Miller, and one of their initiatives is to try and bring high-speed internet to everywhere in the district. And that would certainly help with this because that's the, the best way of transmitting this data, but we can use a phone line or cell service. We do run into delayed readings and a number of other things that occur when we depend on those. And, and the internet has proven to be by far the best method of communicating these numbers. Um, 
So that's it about that. Um, threw in another slide about one of our home visits. Um, you never know who you're going to meet doing this job. This was one of the home visits that I went with our community paramedics and we have come across a good number of our seniors that we're supporting that have a love for animals. And sometimes that love for animals comes before their own health. And uh, so we have run into instances where people have a fixed income and spend a lot of that money that they get on keeping their animals. And that's, I mean, we all know what good company they can be, um, but that sometimes eats into their ability to feed themselves. So another initiative within our program that we don't talk a lot about, um, but for this committee, I think it's important that, that everyone is aware is food insecurity. So when our community paramedics do a home visit and find that there's an issue with food insecurity that they visit the food bank and we have some grocery stores that give us cards and that we bring these groceries to these individuals and we ensure that they're getting a balanced diet. When we ask them, you know, what have you eaten in the last two or three days and we hear that it's toast and tea, we know that that's not going to be one of the recommendations in Canada's food guide. So we do everything we can to ensure that they have a, a, a good diet as well. Um, this particular animal took a shine to me. Um, I had a hard time getting in the vehicle and getting the door closed without it getting in there with me. So it was quite a unique experience. <clears throat> so I'm going to just talk now about a few more of the programs that fall under the uh, umbrella of our community paramedic program. And when COVID hit, um, our service, our community paramedic program was positioned well to support the initiatives um, that were needed in our communities. And we weren't by any means um, the only service able to do that. Uh, across the province, paramedic services were able to step up very quickly. And, and the premier and health minister described us as uh, nimble and fast to respond because we were there when, you know, and able to support our communities in a number of different initiatives to take on the fight against um, COVID-19. The vehicle you see in the slide is one of our decommissioned ambulances that we made the decision early on in the pandemic that we should keep the vehicles in case we hit a crisis and need to put more vehicles on the road. And this particular vehicle um, had a specific need or I had a specific uh, program in mind and that was to make this one a mobile COVID-19 assessment center. And I looked at a few different options of funding to do this, and we were able to secure some funding um, through the LIN to convert this vehicle to have it identified. Um, so we did a, a fair bit of work on it, and we made it a vehicle that this team of people could travel around our district and do COVID-19 swabbing, and then transport the swabs to the lab. And we wanted to have it as a backup plan should there be an outbreak in a community in a school or in a business or anywhere that we had to go and get a great number of people tested quickly. And we received funding to support this and to put three people onto this project full time. And so these three people um, moved around the district doing this program and um, it proved its, its need. Uh, it worked out very well. The funding for it ended in the spring and we knew that particularly East Perry Sound still had a need for having some sort of an assessment center. So when this vehicle was no longer funded to, to have this team mobile, um, we began doing the COVID-19 swabs at the South River EMS station on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. And we have done a great number of them. And I, you know, I didn't think to look at the numbers before this meeting, but I can assure you that it's in the hundreds of people that we have swabbed um, for COVID-19. So the, the, the swabbing was one of the, the first things that we stepped up to do and uh, proved that it was very beneficial. Uh, this is two of our community paramedics and these, uh, so Clayton that you see in the picture, Clayton is our supervisor that oversees the program. And beside him is Krista Hampel. Uh, Clayton works in the west side of the district. Krista works in the east side of the district. She works out of South River as do I. And both of these two are instrumental in the success of our program. They're very good at what they do. And this picture is one that I took on day one of the COVID-19 vaccination program for homebound clients. So we were approached early, uh, 
early on when the vaccine was developed and, and was going to happen that there'd be a vaccination program for our participation in the program. And we participate in two ways. So we have paramedics at all of the public um, vaccination clinics that occur within the district of Perry Sound. We have them there um, ready to deal with any emergencies should they arise. And we also have them there to work as vaccinators. This particular side of the program is homebound vaccines. So this is for clients that are identified to us, referred to us from public health that are not able to get to a clinic for mobility restrictions. And we take the vaccine and vaccinate them in their home. And I'm happy to say that um, to this point, we're in excess of 400 vaccines delivered this way for the first um, round of, of the shots. That number is still growing. We're weekly receiving more referrals from public health for people that still need their first shot that, that somehow missed it. And this week, in fact, just yesterday, we began with the second round of vaccines. So we're now going back down our list and setting up appointments to visit and do the second shot. Um, this is uh, something that our paramedics are pretty passionate about. Um, when COVID happened, it changed a lot of the things that we do on a daily basis. It meant that, that we're now wearing all this extra PPE. We're coming to a much more stressful workplace. You know, we fear that we're going to catch this and take this to our homes. It was really nice to finally be a part of a solution to end this. So we embrace the opportunity to work in delivering these vaccines. So um, to get a little bit more information now about our long-term care funding and how we support those on the long-term care wait list within the District of Perry Sound. Um, we receive referrals from the Lynn for these people. Some of these people, coincidentally, a good number of them were already clients in our program and had been receiving support. So we had been supporting a number of these people beforehand, but for the ones that we hadn't, we received the re referrals from the Lynn and we go through a similar process as what I talked about at the start with our home visit and assessing you know, what programs or what part programs that we offer would fit well with um, supporting these people on the long-term care wait list. Um, it caused, uh, created a, a big expansion within our community paramedic program. Again, we went from two people full-time to seven people full-time. The funding is a three-year commitment from the Ministry of Long-Term Care, and it also allowed us to bring an occupational therapist on part-time into our program. And this is, uh, this is very unique, um, having an OT as part of a community paramedic program, but I assure you that it's a, a really natural fit. A lot of what occupational therapists do kind of works right alongside what the principles of our community paramedic program are. So an occupational therapist, we take them, we have them one day a week and we move them from side to side. So one week they're in the west side of the district, the next week they do their one day on the east side of the district. And our community paramedics line up a number of clients that we can take them to. And traditionally an occupational therapist works in a healthcare setting and receives their referrals from a physician to go and assess somebody. This is unique that they're now going to the person and it allows them the opportunity to see the people the way they live and to see their home that if do they need assistive devices in their home to help them ambulate and get around their home. We were specific in our hiring that we hired an occupational therapist that was certified in assistive devices prescriptions. So this person can write a prescription for somebody for a wheelchair, a walker, a cane, whatever it is, any sort of assistive device. And by her prescribing them, 75% of the costs are covered by the provincial government. So this was a big win for us. Um, that's only part of the win. The other part of the win for us is we're bringing in an expert in this field that now teaches our community paramedics about sizing and when people need assisted devices and all of those kinds of things, as well as our occupational therapist has a much more detailed home inspection that she does when she goes into the home. And, and we're learning you know, other things that we may have overlooked in our home visits. So it's a real win-win having an OT um, join our team. And we're very fortunate that we were able to receive the funding um, to do this. So it's a, it's a pretty cool part of the program and uh, makes us somewhat unique. Um, talked earlier about the two expansion of the two offices in Powassan and Humphrey at the fire halls. 
And of course that we have now seven people involved in our uh, community paramedic program. This uh, slide is one of public messaging that our paramedics actually developed and believe it or not, paid for the majority of this um, to put out to the public because there seemed to be you know, a time where people thought they got would get over the hurdle sooner with the pandemic and it, it just kept hanging around and hanging around. And we wanted to reinforce the importance of staying positive. So, you know, stay socially distanced, you know, stay safe and stay positive. And we put these signs up around our district as a way of thanking the public. And I would just add that in the 30 some years that I've been involved in this business, never before have I seen the public support that our um, service has received since the pandemic. To see signs on people's lawns. I mean, we had people dropping off baking. We had, you know, coffee restaurants um, dropping off coffee for us. We be in a drive through or in a restaurant picking up a meal and someone beside us or behind us would want to pay for it. I mean, it's never, we've never seen the support that we've got through this pandemic ever before. So it, it's really something and it was our opportunity to try and give back. Um, this slide is our Clorox 360 sprayer. Um, we purchased this, it was a $7,000 device. And um, I guess, it was important early on in the pandemic that we get these because every time we had somebody that screened as COVID positive, we had to assume that they had COVID-19. And that meant that the vehicle had to be decommissioned uh, for a couple of hours so it could be clean top to bottom before we could put it back into service to transport more people. And we were gonna quickly run out of vehicles and the amount of work that it was taking um, to clean vehicles and try and get them back into service was just, it was very labor intensive. This device allows us to spray the patient compartment and the cab of the ambulance. And in 15 seconds, that sprayer sprays this electrostatically charged particles that attract much like dust to your television screen. These particles are attract to all surfaces, hard and soft in the ambulance. And they call it 360 because it goes in between and underneath all of those surfaces as well. And it disinfects an ambulance. Um, we close the door, we leave it for two minutes and that vehicle is ready to go back on another call. Um, it, needless to say, this was, a, this was a really important thing that we, we get these devices. We now have three of them and that we're able to, um, to start using them. It, it was a game changer for our staff. Um, I just wanted to show a picture of the inside of an ambulance. And um, so when you look on the right, um, you see that this is the in one of the cabinets inside of our vehicles. And you can see that all of these bins are sealed in plastic. And this was not a practice that we had pre-COVID. Um, every, you know, we'd reach in and grab, if we needed a bandage or a dressing, we could just reach in and grab it and pull it out. And everything was, was accessible. We discovered that um, with COVID, we needed to really try and, and minimize the exposure to all of our supplies and equipment. So we had to purchase these big rolls of bags that you see on the left and then a heat sealer. And so we compartmentize all of our supplies and equipment, including our linen. So we'll put blankets, uh, pillow slips and sheets and seal them so that it's one single use and everything is now separated. And this really, you know, it's peace of mind for all of us knowing that there's no cross contamination it also ensures that before we seal it, we've done a count for each of these things and we know that everything's in there. This is a practice that I wish we would have had in place pre-COVID, but it's since COVID we put it in place and it will stay in place for some time because it worked very well for us. So it was just one more thing I wanted to share with you. Um, you may have seen this, if you've seen our paramedics, um, the way we do business has changed dramatically as a result of the pandemic. We go into people's homes now wearing a mask, um, and what I mean is a surgical mask or an N95 on our face. Uh, we also wear, we've purchased and issued these face shields to all of our staff um, to offer protection to their face and their eyes. Uh, we're wearing gowns, we're wearing gloves, and things have really changed. And as the summer heat approaches, it reminds us of how much things have changed because wearing all this garb gets very hot very quickly. And our paramedics, you know, they're, they're still wearing it and we don't see an end in sight. We'll continue wearing all of this stuff to calls. 
it has delayed our response into the homes because now we have to put all this stuff on before we go in and, and we take it off. At least the driver takes it off before they get into the cab to drive to the hospital. Um, and above all, there's been a, quite an expense. So I know that your committee um, has had lengthy discussions around expense and over budgeting and some of it related to COVID. And, and these are the kinds of things that were necessary for us to be able to get through this pandemic. And another thing that I just want to share with you, and Dave may have already done this, but the costs of these things, I mean, we were very fortunate to be able to continue to secure the PPE that our staff needed, but the cost went through the roof. Pre-COVID, we were paying $8 a box for exam gloves, 50 gloves in a box. We go through a number of those. Um, we're now paying uh, just over $60 for that same box. So, and we're not complaining because we're getting them. And, and the world changed with COVID because it wasn't just paramedic or healthcare that was using gloves. Now restaurants are using them, everybody's using them and the demand has skyrocketed. And I guess it's a supply and demand issue, but nonetheless, um, it's affected our, our pricing on this stuff. And, and we have been able to secure it and we haven't, our staff have not had a time where we didn't have the required PPE, but it's been a real challenge. A um, couple of new programs that I want to share with you. Um, this is a new one that's about to start up and it's a palliative care program to support palliative patients in their home and palliative patients uh, we think of most often as people that have a limited amount of time left on this earth. And in the past and currently, when we're called to these homes for these people, we have to take them to the hospital. So they're suffering often in pain, nausea, um, there can be hallucinations, there's a number of reasons why we're there, but usually it's their caregivers can no longer cope with the condition that's come with the disease that's taking their life. And we are participating in a base hospital program and it's a study that our base hospital was approached to participate in. And, and so our base hospital has now completed all of the training with our paramedics. And it's meant that we brought on four new drug directives. So we'll now have the ability to treat these people in their home with new medications to treat things like hallucinations, shortness of breath, nausea, uh, pain, you name it. And Will, won't be required any longer to have to take them to the hospital. And this is, this is a real game changer, not just for these people and their families, because I mean, these people in their last hours don't want to spend that in a hospital and particularly during a pandemic when they're alone and their family can't be surrounding them. But it also isn't a great feeling for our staff to have to haul them out of their home when they're in a lot of discomfort and, and knowing they don't want to go to the emergency department. So. Um, we see this as a big win, not just for um, the people that we serve, but also for our staff. So that's a new program. It's set to start sometime in July, and uh, we're excited to be selected as being able to participate in this program. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, Dave and I talked earlier today, there's been a lot of changes. Things are coming fast and furious recently in terms of the scope of practice for our paramedics and, and the things that we're doing. And, and a lot of it's been driven by pandemic, but this, this is a program that's been in the works for some time and it's, it's not necessarily being driven as much by the pandemic. So there's more to come. Um, we want to expand our point of care testing for our community paramedic program. So instead of just doing the blood viscosity test, we are purchasing devices that will do up to 10 or 12 different blood uh, value uh, analysis so that we'll be able to actually do a blood draw in the home, put blood into the machine, and depending on which laboratory test we're looking for, we'll be able to perform that test right in the patient's home, right at, right at their side. Um, it's, it's pretty cool technology. It, it fits well in our community paramedic program, and we're working towards uh, putting that into place. We did. Um, secure the funding for these devices as part of our long-term care uh, funding, because if we can test these people and do this laboratory work in their home, they don't have to go to a hospital or out of their home to a lab. And again, it's about mobility issues for that, for that demographic. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to share with you is that coming down the road is a STEMI bypass program. And uh, we're, hoping to partner and it looks very positive that we will be partnering with Royal Victoria Hospital in Barrie to capture some of the residents of our district starting out with the very southwest corner of our district 
um, that when people are suffering a heart attack, so we use uh, the term STEMI, which is ST elevation myocardial infarction. And what that means is it's somebody having a heart attack. And, you know, the treatment that's accessible right now for people is clot dissolving medication. So we get them to a hospital, they begin the clot dissolving process, and it works to fix this. The more definitive care is PCI treatment at a cath lab at somewhere like Royal Victoria Hospital, where they actually open the artery up and, uh, and change the flow of, of blood and restore the flow of blood to the heart muscle. So we have had some success with this uh, by taking patients from the east side of our district, from the South River, Sunridge, Birch Falls area, to Huntsville. The Huntsville Hospital um, signed on to this agreement as well. And they have 120 minutes from the time the patient walks through their door to have them at Royal Victoria Hospital in Barrie. And this has only started, um, you know, within the last month. And the, the successes that have occurred have, for the most part, um, through Huntsville, have been our patients that we have taken to Huntsville and they've met the criteria to be shipped off to, um, to Barrie. So there may come a time where we will have to transport these people on to Barrie. Um, they're going to a better and more definitive level of care, but um, currently our neighbors to the south have been uh, accommodating this, these calls and sending a crew to the Huntsville Hospital, picking these people up and transporting them off to Royal Victoria Hospital. But from time to time, it'll happen that they'll be too busy to do that and our crews will have to do that. But again, it's about getting the best care that we can for the residents of Prairie Sound. So, that's, uh, that's coming down the pipe. Uh, we won't see much happen until the spring of uh, 2022. That's, uh, that's all I have. I know it was a lot. Um, I hope I didn't bore you and I hope I made it in a, presented it in a way that you could understand. If anybody has any questions or comments, I'm uh, happy to, to take those now. Okay. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, if we could take this stop sharing and then I can see everybody, that would be great. Frank, thank you very much. I mean, that was a lot of information, but really good information as well. So very much appreciate it. Any questions of, of Frank? Rod. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Frank, that was an excellent presentation, well-prepared and very educational. And uh, kudos again today for being one of the pioneers in this community project back years back. Uh, who I think, Dave, you, you originated this thing here. Uh, two questions. I was glad to hear that you don't necessarily need Wi-Fi because some of our rural areas, good luck with that. Uh, the fact that you can use cell phone or telephone to transmit data, uh, I guess, makes up for, for that shortfall. But that gives even more impetus to increase Internet throughout the district. Uh, the only question I have was, your paramedics, have they been fully vaccinated throughout the district? Well, that's, that's a good question, Rod. Um, so the paramedics that want to receive the vaccination as of Friday, all of our staff will have both doses. So they still have, they, they still have not. I'm really surprised at that. Well, we... I think we have four people remaining that have agreed to take the vaccine and we have a, a compliance rate that I would say sits around 90%. Um, so we probably have about 10% of our staff that, that aren't willing to take that vaccine. And at this point, there's, you know, there's nothing that we're going to be able to do about that. But um, those that want it, we've been able to get both doses for them. As of Friday, our last four people will, will have the second dose. So it, that won't become a workplace requirement in the future. I know some businesses are contemplating return to mm -hmm. work and whether or not their employees are fully vaccinated may have some implications. Is there any ruling from the province on, on that? Because if you've got someone at not vaccinated that could be a potential carrier, even though you use PPP, dealing with elderly people I see that as, as a potential problem. And I'm really surprised that any paramedic or any medical person would, although I know it's happening in hospitals, there's some hospital staff refusing to. Um, anyway, good to know, I, I'm just surprised. I don't know if it's an availability thing, but when you're starting to offer it to 12 years and up, 
I can't believe that paramedics haven't been double inoculated months ago. But once again, thank you for your presentation. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, so we, I mean, we have received the first round of protection was early on in February and March, and we felt somewhat protected. I can say it was a, a sense of relief for the majority of our staff. We were we were pretty happy, and, and now having the second shot, it's just that much more security. But, um, you know, it's, it's a big question around making people get the vaccine, and it's one that, unfortunately, I, I don't have an answer for. Um, the people that will be determining that are certainly at a a higher level than, than what I am at, so. Thank you. Irene, and then, Irene and then Kathy. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. So um, I have lots of questions and probably too many to take up the time here to ask, so I might call you direct. But um, so the number one startup was this um, community paramed program is to reduce 911 calls. My first question is, have they been reduced? And greatly enough that you'd say, wow, this is really working or yes, it's working. Um, the other one is that it's going to be approximately $70 per month. You want a six month to one year commitment. When I hear that price, I think that's cheap. That's what I think. But then you also said it's free but nothing's free. So who is paying for it? And is that me as in my taxes paying uh, for EMS service or is this um, something provincial that the province is still gonna get my taxes but it'll look like the money came from them. And um, so when we're talking about long-term care is sponsored, um, you want a three-year commitment from the long-term long care so what happens in three years if they say, we don't want to? So those were three primary questions and I have a dozen others, but again, I'm, I'm not gonna hold up the uh, meeting for all of them, but those would be my three primary ones right now. Thank you. Okay, um, I can answer uh, probably a couple of those for you, Irene. The Thank you. $70 a month, um, nobody, none of our users pay that. So that money comes from the provincial government and it's been coming uh, from either the Lynn or Ontario Health North. And last year um, to prepare for the second wave of COVID, they invited proposals to support COVID and other vulnerable populations with this program of remote monitoring. Um, I was one of the service, I say we were one of the services that applied for that funding. There was not a great deal of interest, uh, particularly in the North. I partnered uh, with Thunder Bay and uh, initially it was gonna be just the two services. Uh, eventually Cochrane District and the city of Greater Sudbury joined. And they were the four services that submitted a proposal for funding to um, expand this program and um, that's where the, the money comes from for that. And it continues as, uh, because it's proven to be a cost-effective way of providing healthcare, electronic healthcare monitoring. So it's, it's a very cost-effective way. So to answer your first question, has it continued to be successful? Absolutely, it has continued. Still people pop up that seem to be frequent users and we, can catch that and you know assess their need for programs like this, but often this particular program in reducing their number and their dependency on the healthcare system and the visits to eMERGE. Um, I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression that it's about us trying to get out of having to do calls. That's not the case at all. But there's a clear dollar value attached with taking someone to a hospital and seeing an emergency physician. And that's, that's what we're really targeting. Jamie, if I can just touch on the broader issue of funding, because sure. yep. I think it ties into Irene's um, question. So Frank outlined a number of uh, programs here. By far the lion's share of our funding still comes in for emergency response to the tune of about 10 times as much comes for emergency response than the rest of these programs. However, that being said, the rest of these programs right now are all funded through other agencies. And there are a variety of other agencies. When I first started doing this here for the town eight years ago, and when I previously was with Sequin sitting on the committee in your seats, 
the on, we only had one stream of funding and that was through the municipal taxpayer and the 50% that the province puts in. That was the only thing we did. Now, and the other only thing we did was uh, emergency response. So there has been a significant shift in the past five years specifically to all the, and two years mainly, to all these other uh, programs that Frank's talking about. Now, the funding streams come from numerous different sources, such as Ministry of Long-Term Care, the LIN Health Unit. Um, and to complicate things even more, some of those funding sources cannot fund municipalities. So the funding has to flow to another agency. I think it's fortunate in that we have, that we work so closely with the hospital because for some of these programs, the LIN funds, and they can only fund healthcare facilities such as the hospital. So now we have multiple programs, multiple streams of funding. It's uh, quite a complicated system as to what it was eight years ago from a funding perspective. Now, you all know there's only one taxpayer. So no matter what, the taxpayer is paying for all these programs. Uh, however, only the emergency response dollars are coming out of the municipal tax system. So I hope that clarifies uh, a little bit for you. What happens in three years? Uh, Frank and I can't predict that. It is a three-year program. I've heard lots of... Um, People suggest, well, this is just a way to get uh, the uh, municipalities to take this over. We'll see in three years. Prior to COVID, there was a big push to change the entire uh, emergency response system. What that was going to look like, we didn't know. COVID hit and totally derailed that program. We weren't sure if it was going to be larger amalgamations, a shift of funding. They were talking about shifting more dollars onto the municipalities. I would suggest a lot of that is out the window right now. However, as COVID calms down in the next six months, I suspect that the province, especially if they're reelected, will look back into those uh, programs and how it's going to act with the Ontario health teams and all the rest of those particular issues. Um, so there are unknowns out there. What is going to happen to the long-term care funding in three years? I am of the optimistic person and I think that we'll be able to see how much improvement to the overall healthcare system these kinds of programs are making and hopefully there'll be a shift of dollars in terms of the funding for these sorts of things. Because of success so thank you. Thank you. I will have one last question not now. Go ahead. Thank you. Kathy? Oh, I just wanted to say that all these good programs that Frank's uh, talking about, I think I'm ready to come back to work. <laughs> and we used to um, call them frequent flyers, Frank, not frequent people. <laughs> and we used to say, thank you for flying with Air Catherine. <laughs> but these, these programs are fantastic. We did this years ago, but we just sat around and had a cup of tea with them for five seconds and tore off on another call. So. Uh, all these paramedics are really good at what they do. So I really love to come back, but I don't think I will. Just to antagonize <laughs> Frank, I might. <laughs> the door's always open, Kathy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Any other questions on this? Irene? Okay. If there's no more from anyone, I do have a big one for you here, Frank. So this takes us to the very end of your presentation. But I do have more I'll talk to you personally about, but just for this. So at the very end, you said talking about STEMI, um, you know, persons having a heart attack and um, they're going to go from Huntsville to Barry to get the better help. That's great. I'm in Perry Sound District and I live in Calendar. My hospital's in North Bay and so is my doctor. What happens to me? Is that ambulance going to come from Huntsville to Calendar to pick me up to take me to North Bay? Because I'm not the only person in Calendar who could have heart problems. So that for me is a real big question is if my tax dollars here are paying to support you back there, I'm saying you did the program. How is that program going to help me on my bad day? When again, my hospital's in North Bay and my doctor's in that hospital in North Bay. Am I being routed to Barry? I don't know anybody. 
No, Irene, you, you're not going to be routed to Barry. Um, the okay. North Bay Regional Hospital has a similar program in place that they partner with HSN and Sudbury. And I, I want to make it very clear that um, I am in no way saying that you are getting a, a secondary level of care. The no, um, no, that's hospitals not what I that mean. don't participate in this still provide that important care in a timely fashion in terms of dissolving the clots and all of the, the things right. that they do. And the North Bay Regional Health Center actually had a TV commercial running for a while saying, talking about the provincial standard of door to needle time and how they were exceeding the provincial standard. It's, a, it's an incredible healthcare facility. So you're, you're, you're getting great care. So if I made that 911 call, my response is still gonna come from North Bay because I live in Calendar. Uh, not necessarily. Our Powassan yeah. vehicle covers calendar um, a fair okay. bit as well. Right. But you're going okay. to end up at the closest hospital because we're legislated to take you to the closest hospital. And the program that I talked about was, a, if you recall, it was a STEMI bypass. Right. And what, yeah. what bypass programs mean, there's bypass programs in place for things like strokes. And the North right. Bay Regional Hospital is one of those bypass centers for strokes. So if somebody having a stroke, they're going to go there for that kind of stroke okay. treatment that they would get, that okay. they wouldn't get at a, a different hospital. So each hospital can sometimes have its, its niche. But when we bypass a hospital to go to another one for a specific reason, we have to be sure that what we're doing is the right thing because we're supposed to take you to the closest hospital all of the time. And okay. an example might be somebody having a stroke that, you know, we're in between and it's closer to go to say uh, Perry Sound or Huntsville Hospital, but now they're going to go to a different hospital. Well, when it comes to strokes, Huntsville's another stroke center as well. But right. um, when the illness is, is supported by a hospital that has specialized treatment, that's the option that we have um, when that agreement exists that we can bypass another hospital and go directly to those facilities that offer that definitive care. Okay. Yeah. Just wondered how it worked for the people on the border towns, you know? Thank you. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. no, um, North Bay Regional Health Center, uh, an amazing facility. I, I certainly right. want to be clear to say that that wasn't my intention there. No, okay. I think you're Thank looked you. after, Irene. Yeah, it's just, I mean, I'm not the only person who lives in Calendar, but we go through yeah. this cross-border issue in lots of areas. Yeah. And it just yeah. made me, when we're talking about, you know, from Huntsville, you're going to go to Barrie. And I'm thinking, but I live here in Calendar. By the time you even got to me, mm -hmm. kiss me yeah. goodbye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're 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 okay. you're protected. You're okay. safe. That's okay. Right. And then I'll ask for um, a frequent flying pilot. Here <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. I am. <laughs> okay. Um, was that it for questions then? Lyle? Um, I just wanted to make a comment that this program is great. It's going to save lives for people that are right in the middle. That's Sunder South River and Brooks Falls. Don't know which way to go. And when all of a sudden you're saving that stop in between, it'll be very important to people's health. And thank you for bringing that program in, Frank and Dave. Yeah, Lyle, so the, the program for that's affected us most recently is really credit to the Huntsville District Memorial Hospital for signing the partnership and becoming a part of the program with RVH. So that when we take our patients, because it only allows us a 60 minute drive time um, to these facilities. And as you know, we can't make it to RVH in 60 minutes. But when we transport these people to Huntsville, now it's 120 minutes from the time they walk through the door, which gives the option then for them to be transported to RVH. So the, the real credit here goes to our friends at uh, at Huntsville Hospital for participating in this program, particularly when it comes to those municipalities that you mentioned. Whoever's responsible, it's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. Good. Thanks, Frank. You're very welcome. Thank you very everybody. much. Appreciate uh, yeah. it. So much. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. your time as well. And I mean, uh, I appreciate that you have an interest to be informed about some of these programs. And I look forward to an opportunity to meet with you again. And hopefully we'll have some more new and innovative things that we can talk about. Good. Good. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um,
Dave, your report. Through you, Mr. Chairperson. Let me see. I want to make sure I'm still not on mute. I mean, <laughs> first of all, um, I really appreciate Frank coming and talking to you about this from a clinical standpoint, as well as an operational standpoint. You can sense his passion uh, for paramedicine and how much he cares about people. And um, uh, it's a credit to him. A lot of these um, programs that are expanding and growing and uh, his passion for that. Rod had mentioned that uh, uh, about when we initially brought in the community paramedicine program. Well, that was a very, very minor program as compared to what is running now. And um, the credit goes to uh, Frank, uh, the EMS staff. Uh, there are numerous individuals who have really grabbed the bull by the horns and expanded this program and taken it to places we couldn't even imagine it was going to go when we first started. And when we first started it, it was really just about wellness checks and um, things of that nature. It didn't have any of the clinical aspects that the program does now. None of the blood testing, none of the palliative care components, um, all these other things. And that has come directly from the, uh, the clinical medics and the supervisors in pushing the boundaries of what is viewed as their scope of practice uh, far beyond um, what it used to be. And I know Kathy can uh, most definitely say that it's a massive change over the past 10 years. And it was a massive change from the 10 years previous to that as well. So it, uh, these individuals are uh, real healthcare uh, individuals who have exceptional training to be able to provide the level of care to the residents that they do. Thanks for letting me get on that soapbox for a few moments. <laughs> um, so with regards to some more mundane aspects, uh, we have our uh, regular comments with regards to our EMS bases. So Frank did touch on that Humphrey and Powassan, we've expanded our operations uh, in those communities. That's where we're basing our long-term care community paramedicine programs out of. The Humphrey Ambulance Base was able to be, um, the Humphrey Fire Hall slash Ambulance Base was able to be uh, expanded to accommodate the extra people and the extra vehicles that are in that hall. So that's a, a big thank you to Humphrey. In Powassan, uh, we have the, um, the base, the EMS base in Powassan, but it was not suitable to be expanded. However, they have a lovely new fire hall and um, they did greet us with open arms there in putting our uh, long-term care program for the east side in the Powassan base. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's new. Argyle, um, we will be continuing to talk about Argyle. A lot of it has to do with regards to what's going to occur as we move from 8 to 10 to 12 hours in the uh, Argyle station and uh, whether we retain on-call services. Uh, the Argyle station is not very conducive to having people stay overnight there on call the way we currently have it in place. Uh, we'll have to do some have some discussions uh, as it comes around budget time about what on-call is going to look like if we're going to have on-call there in the future. And if we decide to keep that, there are going to be uh, station implications. Additionally, it is still not ideal that we have the uh, ambulance stationed away from the base in Argyle. It means that that ambulance, once it goes into service, is sitting at the uh, nurse's station and idling throughout the day to keep everything warm inside of it. Um, South River, I want to touch on it. This is the first time that I've started to mention South River, and it does tie into Frank's presentation, actually, in terms of the amount of storage that we're now utilizing for regular PPE. Um, we are starting to burst at the seams at South River due to, first of all, our community paramedicine program, the, the primary program, the one that was funded and still is funded by the Lynn, uh, as well as uh, all the additional storage which is now occurring in our bases. The Perry Sound Base used to have a training room in it. That's now a storage facility. And that is because the lesson learned when the pandemic hit is that you need to keep stock of PPE for these organizations now because you never know when the supplies are going to dry up like they did last January. Uh, so uh, 
currently Perry Sound has no training room. They utilize the fire hall here for almost all their training that you do now on the uh, west side, and we have no problems with that in, a, in assisting. However, the base is not being utilized for the way it's supposed to. South River is in a similar uh, circumstance, and we now have vehicles that are sitting outside that should not be sitting outside. Again, uh, it is something we're going to have to address and talking to uh, South River about the possibility of a partnership similar to what we've done in Point of Barrel with the community, I think needs to be on everyone's radar. Now we'd be talking about a lot more significant uh, base at South River if we did that. It would be similar to the Powassan Fire Hall or the Humphrey Fire Hall for those of you who are familiar with those locations uh, is what would be required. So there's training requirements that aren't being met as well as equipment housing requirements that aren't being met. And a lot of that overflow is in Perry Sound currently and needs to be out of that station. So that's on the radar for everyone to just know about. Nothing's going to happen in 2021. Uh, planning maybe in 2022. And we'll have to look about something happening after that. Uh, financial position. Uh, so that's a nice uh, couple of sentences there in that we look like we're on track right now for a balanced budget. Uh, haven't been able to tell you that for a couple of years, and I'm very happy to be able to tell you that. I hope it carries on that way. Uh, and also the second sentence in terms of sick time costs uh, appear to be under control and uh, meeting the standards that uh, the health center set. So um, I'm hoping that that continues throughout the summer and into the fall. Uh, just as another thing to put on your radar, electronic patient care uh, reports, that's the primary reporting mechanism that the paramedics use, and it's all uh, based through their in-vehicle laptops. Uh, we will be looking at doing an RFP for a new provider in 2022, maybe be the same provider, but we'll be releasing an RFP anyways for the services. This is a fairly expensive um, uh it's a large cost to us to the tune of uh, fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year, and as standards are increasing, there is higher expectations for these uh, EPCR providers and the amount of activity that they do. For example, um, the whole system ties together from the cardiac monitors to the laptops to transmitting that information to the reporting foundations. So to use to do the STEMI bypass that Frank was just talking about, one of the components that's required is the ability to transmit the, um, the cardiac monitors, what they're receiving off someone's uh, chest directly to the receiving hospitals. So we need to be able to provide that level of service. Some of our components right now are capable of doing that. Our cardiac monitors are quite capable of doing it. We have all Wi-Fi in all the vehicles. So the PCRs need to be able to handle that capacity as well. So that's going to uh, be part of the RFP that does come up next year. So it is a, a fairly expensive component to our program. That appears to be all on the director's report. If there's any questions about any of those issues or any others, I'd happy to answer them, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, Rod? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I just wondered, do you use the Zoom little blue hand participants or not? The, at the bottom of your screen, there's participants, shows all the people. If you click your blue hand, do you monitor that or we just do it this way? Just do it that way. Okay, because we've got <laughs> we've only got we've only got what eight people on here, so right. okay, It'd be different so, if there was thirty. Thank you. So my question, uh, Dave, is uh, uh, first of all, with regards to the uh, sick time being under those costs being under control, that's good news. Uh, first time in a long time. To what do you attribute that? Is it just management? Um, <laughs> Or what, what changed? Through you, Mr. Chairperson, I think a couple things changed in terms of uh, management of the issue is one of them for sure. 
I was talking to Frank, uh, not about this specific issue, but I was talking to Frank earlier today about his presentation here tonight and how I wanted to do more of this um, increased or enhanced communication with you as a membership. And one thing I talked to him about was at one of the next meetings, have the uh, peer support uh, medics come and talk to you about their programs that they're running. So that is one major enhancement that has occurred in an attempt to deal with uh, the sick time issues is the peer support program. So there's a, um, we'll look at having a couple of the medics come and talk to you about those programs in uh, future meetings. And I think that is a, a clear component of somewhere where the hospital has really increased its activity in terms of trying to uh, deal with uh, PTSD and mental health within the, the ranks. And uh, Frank's management style is also uh, going to be of a, assistance. He's a, a straight shooter and, um, and uh, there seems to be a res response to that as well. So I would say there's numerous reasons um, okay, and probably you. some that we, uh, we're, we're completely unaware of as well. Do you care? Uh, yes, I recall we spent a, a, a small sum of money in order to enhance that uh, emotional care for PTSD, et cetera. Uh, so I guess that's one of the factors that's working. It would appear as if it's having a positive impact. Yeah. My second question was on the electronic. Uh, you, you, were, you touched on the electronic sending of records from a Wi-Fi and an ambulance to healthcare center. Uh, is this where you can actually have the hospital remotely monitor a patient in transit for heart measurements? Is is that what you're what you're referring to there? Through you, you can Mr. actually Chair. send real time data. Through you, Mr. Chairperson. Yes, it's components of that being able to send real time data and the right. hospital being able to in real time witness um, the cardiac rhythms that the right. medics are experiencing in the back of the ambulance. Wow, it took a while. As an uh, employee of Motorola back in the 80s, we were working on the technology for that particular purpose. And I thought it would never get, get there. Uh, but yeah. 40 years later, I guess we've arrived. So that's good news. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, any other questions of uh, Dave? No? OK. Uh, may I have a mover? Louie, did you have a hand up there for a sec or was that? Uh, sorry, Jamie. Uh, oh. All I want to do is bring up a point of order. I, I think we forgot to make a motion to accept uh, Frank May's presentation. Did we do that? Did I miss it? Uh, no, we, we don't need to do that. The, the next is to for Dave's report. Okay. That's, that's the next. Okay, one. I was looking on the agenda. I had that. That's all. Okay. I'll move it, Jamie. Okay, moved by Kathy, seconded. Uh, and I'll second it since I'm talking anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, that the emergency services director's report uh, dated June 16th, 2021 be accepted as submitted. Anyone opposed to that? No, nope. then that's carried. So next we have reports. Um, Three any, you, question, any questions, Dave? Did you have any? You want to elaborate on any of those uh, reports, or through you, Mr. Chairperson? Um, I would like to point out page fourteen of the agenda, which is called the response time standards. Uh, Frank was alluding to this, and since we do have new members, it's important to for them to realize that the standards that are set, some of them are provincially set. Some of them are self-determined, are clearly outlined on page 14. So that's the one that's uh, entitled Perryson District EMS Response Time Standards uh, for April 2021. And it identifies uh, the different targets as well as what we're actually achieving for measurement of response times. Um, and then the, the upper chart does uh, break things down on a more, more minute scale. You have to realize that when we look at some of these are very there are very few of these types of responses in any given month. Um, so there may be no responses, actually. You can see that in uh, Perry Sound under the SCAs, which stands for Sudden Cardiac Arrest, there were zero calls um, of that nature. So um, just 
you, you know, something for you to be aware of when you see these reports, the bottom component of that chart does identify what our 2021 target is. And beside that, you'll see what our 2021 year to date is. So we do have to report on these and they are published publicly on the Ministry of Health website, uh, what our standards are. And, you know, we are unique, maybe us in Muskoka and Halliburton in having a very widespread population. And you can easily see when you go and take a look at the ministry where you can see all the different districts that we do have extended response times. And the fact remains that we have residents scattered throughout the bush all through our entire district. And you can't have an ambulance on every corner and it's not always going to be in the right location. And it sure can't be on an island in Georgian Bay. So, um, we have some extended response times. That's all there is to it. Yep. That's right. Uh, the other aspect I would like to point out is on the um, 6 .2 or 6.2 EMS night calls. There's uh, two components to this. And so the first chart, that would be page 18, just identifies the um, number of calls, the number of uh, different bases throughout the, the district for nighttime calls. Uh, remembering that on the east side, transport times are greatly um, extended as compared to what they are on the west side of the district, simply due to the fact that the east side does not have a hospital within its boundaries. They're traveling outside of their boundaries, either to North Bay or to Huntsville, no matter what. Uh, so although there may be fewer calls in there, those calls individually take much longer to conduct. Uh, in both uh, taking a patient to hospital as well as getting your, your vehicle back in service from that particular hospital. On page 19, uh, it does demonstrate our callbacks in Perry Sound. We have a um, small callback window from 2300 to 0800, and that's even smaller actually when we get into the summer and have the summer, summer X up staff, and we're averaging one callback per week in Perry Sound. In Argyle, the first portion of the year was done on um, 16 hours of callback because we had eight hours on staff. That has moved now to 10 hours staffed. So it would be 14 hours of callback. And we're down to an average of uh, 0.83 callbacks per week in uh, at the Argyle base. Recognizing again, Argyle call volume is higher in June, July, August, and September. So. Um, without taking a look at a whole year on what the change to hours in Argyle is going to do, it's uh, difficult to project. Very good. Any question on any of those reports? Rod? Is there, uh, Mr. Chair, through you, Dave, is there any vehicle replacement in 21 we should be aware of? Schedule? you, Mr. Chairperson, in 2021, the committee approved through the budget the replacement of two ambulances and actually one PRU. However, Frank and I, through some um, creative adjustments when we got the LTC, a long-term care funding, we actually transferred one of the PRUs into that funding envelope. So we're not going to be paying for that uh, PRU out of the municipal funding uh, envelope this year. It's coming out of the long-term care funding envelope. Um, which again is 100% from the provincial government. So there will be two ambulances being replaced. Uh, there is a significant issue with getting ambulances right now due to the backlog of some of the relays that are coming out of other countries and is affecting the entire automotive industry. So I'm not exactly sure when we're going to get those ambulances. Thanks, Dave. Irene? Thank you, Mr. Chair. For you to uh, Dave, how much is an ambulance? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> through uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, hold on to your seats because the prices are going up. Um, okay. But an ambulance now is at least is not as bad as getting a municipal fire truck. The ambulances are running about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the features we get, and I will tell you, we do not get a really high priced ambulance. We look really, it's fairly bare bones. There are a few little uh -huh. extras we do get. Uh, one of them being that we always get double stretcher ambulances mm -hmm. uh, just because mm -hmm. of the nature of our community. However, 
we do get fairly bare bones ambulances and uh, yeah, 150,000 is approximately the, uh, the cost to expect. We're changing. They, and is that with it, like, okay, what happens with HST? We write that off or you have to add that to it too? Through you, Mr. Chair, HST for the uh, ambulance service is the exact same as for the municipal function. So I think you end up paying 1.25% or something like that. Yeah. Um, okay. So you don't, you pay very little um, HST. Now, uh, the life cycle of one of those ambulances is approximately five years. Unbelievable. Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Any other questions? No, uh, can I have a mover and seconder to accept the reports? Irene and Scott, the EMS committee members have received report 616263 as listed. Anyone opposed to, to that? Nope, that's carried. Okay. Um, other business? So, Mr. Mayor, the uh, first would be 8.1 um, meeting yep. schedule. Yeah. That report. So, none of these reports are moving through to town uh, council. There's nothing that needs to go through town council at this particular meeting. It's it's simply for the committee uh, awareness and uh, decision making on our parts. Um, if the as the report says, we used to have a regular meeting schedule. We did get away from that in terms of um, they're not necessarily always being uh, items to review. And at that time, people were having to drive from Powassan to Perry Sound or come up from Toronto from, uh, you know, uh, if you're a cottager to do the meetings. So we did at a certain point roll back and say, we're only gonna have meetings of the call of the chair when there were items to be discussed. I think that's one of the issues with regards to the communication um, that we've seen. Now that we have the ability to do uh, online meetings, I think it would be worthwhile for the committee to uh, take a look at a regular schedule. It's easier for planning in that when I do have to try to uh, schedule a meeting, it's very hard to schedule all seven of your, meet all seven of your schedules when it hasn't been planned out for a long time ahead of time. And uh, and again, I said, I think there's there's benefits into increasing communication if we have this on a regular schedule. So I've proposed three meetings in here on a regular schedule of dates that we have generally used in the past that seem to work into people's schedules. So um, I guess it's up to the committee. First of all, if you want to entertain this concept, and if you do, then are the meetings at the right times for you? Uh, Scott? Yeah, I think uh, through the chair, I think it's very reasonable uh, ask of committee members to yeah. uh, some forward planning to schedule mm -hmm. uh, these meetings. We always have the option where um, if they're in our schedule and um, there's um, a very little to discuss or uh, where priorities come up, you know, whereby uh, something urgent has to be uh, deliberated over and before a committee meeting, um, we can always postpone, but it's in the uh, schedule. And I think that goes two ways as well, David, that uh, Dave, that we, you know, we come to you with <laughs> with some items uh, occasionally for the agenda and we can do that uh, with some forward planning. So uh, I would support adopting yeah. a model where we regularly meet and they are scheduled. Thank you. Any comments? Louis? Uh, um, tonight was a council meeting for me, but if I could be the second or for, fourth, it would be better than first or third. So Wednesday's council meeting, but since I hadn't, we had had one of these, I just made it to this one instead. Didn't you, isn't it the fourth Thursday in the month? Well, I just saying if it's a Wednesday, that's, I know we changed it around, so. So through you, Mr. Chairperson, I am proposing the fourth Thursdays because in the past, it appears that Thursdays had been better for the majority of the, the group. So that's what I have proposed here is fourth Thursday. Yeah. Fine. We're in council on Thursdays on the third week. So it's perfectly good for me. Yeah. Yeah. Good for me. Mm -hmm. And that's monthly or quarterly? No. Uh, Through you, Mr. Chairperson, I've proposed February, May, and October 
And okay. there's specific reasons for that. Uh, specifically, the October, we can usually always do budget at that time frame. So that's that's mm -hmm. quite important. And really, the fourth Thursday of November would be too late um, from my liking. Um, mm -hmm. And I tried to stay away from summer because I think everyone mm -hmm. wants to be out on the boats and on their lakes. And uh, if we're going to re uh, meet remotely, there's nothing wrong with having one in February in the middle of the winter time. That's right. So our next our next meeting then would be October twenty eighth, right? Fourth Thursday in October. I'm just going to look at my yeah. calendar to make sure that that would be right. Yes, is it? yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, I got it marked in my book. Got it. Me too. <laughs> All right, so we have a resolution, if I can get a mover and seconder. Louis and Rod, uh, that the EMS Advisory Committee supports the EMS Advisory Committee meeting schedule as recommended and report R&R EMS Advisory Committee meeting schedule AD 2021. Anyone opposed to that? No. Nope, that's carried then. Eight two, Dave. So this deals with the uh, supplemental levy and the deficit from oh, me. from twenty twenty. So it appears that um, we don't have audited financials yet, but it is looking like the hospital would be uh, running about a three hundred fifty thousand dollar deficit uh, for last year. We had estimated it at four hundred fifty thousand. That's why we'd. Uh, asked for that extra uh, extra funds when we um, did. So um, that is good in that there's $100,000 uh, less required. Uh, there are a couple options there. Um, I am still concerned, although we're in a strong financial position right now for 2021. It is the beginning of summer. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. How many times have we been surprised by COVID already? I'd like to think that we're going back to some semblance of normal, but my faith on that is a little bit gone after what happened this winter. So um, what I'm suggesting is that uh, the, the surplus, uh, once everything does get audited and come out, go into reserves uh, in case there is a need to utilize those funds, we have drawn down for the past two years on reserves, and uh, it is a concern to me. The alternative would be to uh, return that portion of uh, that wasn't required back to the municipalities, and I believe there's also merit in that as well. It was intended for as a COVID bridge um, and a one-year bridge, so um, uh, there is merit there. Of those two choices, you. Um, you know, we can consider what that would be when we do get the fine uh, edit or sorry, audited financials and uh, have to make a decision, which would be at our October meeting. Any discussion on that? No? Through you, Mr. Chairperson, I would yeah. love it if anyone has opinion one way or the other to know where they're leaning at this yeah. time. Well, if they don't, <laughs> then that's fine. But uh, what I was hoping... <laughs> <laughs> yeah Scott, I, yeah I, I i know there's sensitivities uh um uh, amongst um all the townships including mine about uh escalating costs and covid and so forth but i think it's prudent to go to uh put it in surplus uh or in reserve sorry um i i think in this area of of um of operations uh you know life is unpredictable and uh and i think staff's done an uh, excellent job of trying to anticipate these things we also need to give uh, tools to to accommodate these bumps in the road so uh, i'm um i realize the merit on the the other side of that which is giving back and and uh, demonstrating that we have been uh uh, prudent with the money and we're able to overcome some of the obstacles, but I also think it's equally prudent to have uh, something in the bank um, for unexpected uh, items coming up. So 
Um, but I, I'm I'm happy to be swayed uh, the opposite way. But th that would be where I would stand. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Rod. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would agree with Scott on that issue. It's probably better put it in put it in reserve for the unexpected. Thank you. Okay. Kathy, I'm with the boys. Reserve. <laughs> Lyle. Uh, as you know, we pro we have problems getting doctors here, and if we have problems with uh, emergency health care on top of that, that would just <laughs> compound things, and that's something we do not want. So anything that we can do to make the paramedic system work better, reserves, more cash from the east hand side, at least in our area, it, that's a good thing. Okay. I agree. Okay. I agree. You good with that, Dave? Thank, thank you, everyone. Um, there will be further reports coming, so I do appreciate to get a feel for the group, though, as we move forward. That helps me. I think Louie was going to say something. I think. Yeah, I just would uh, agree with the consensus being a new guy. It seems to be the best sense is reserve. It'd be nice to give the municipalities back money, but uh, yeah, we. I think it, reserve would be much better. And okay. if I could... Yes, Scott. As a final thought, uh, Mayor McGarvey identified uh, when this levy came in, we did receive um, we did receive monies from the province to spend on extraordinary COVID expenses, and uh, staff did as uh, you know extraordinary response to a, to a difficult time, and I think we saw that with the uh, new paramedicine efforts. Uh, yeah, you know, it's not a huge amount of money, but I, I am sensitive to other councillors. Uh, challenges to try to explain that to uh, to some municipalities who had who had a, a, a quite a difficult time with that notion uh, uh, in the beginning on the levy. So, but I think it's worth uh, stating again. Thanks. Okay. All right, Dave, you're good with all that. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Okay, do you want that somehow incorporated into the uh, resolution that we're going to? pass or just leave it the way it is and i don't think through, it. through you mr chairperson i don't think it's necessary that the committee make a decision as of now uh, okay. we, i will be coming back with a report that will go to yeah. to town council so you know a decision can be made then this just helps give me a little bit of guidance about what's yeah. palatable to the municipalities okay. very good very good i want to double check okay uh mover and seconder irene and Scott, the EMS Advisory Committee acknowledges the report R&R &R 2020 EMS financial position AD 2021 for information purposes. Anyone opposed to that? Nope, that's carried then. 8-3, um, Dave. So 8-3 is just an update for you. Uh, we did deal with this in a closed session. Um, previously because it did deal with negotiations so the outcome of uh this and again the town nor the committee do not make decisions on hr issues that's the hospital's responsibility um so it was provided to you for information purposes beforehand we don't make any recommendations to the hospital on these issues so this is the update in terms of how this is being dealt with. So the issue was over eight hour shifts and the contract um, not allowing for eight hour shifts. And so the negotiated uh, result was a shift from eight hours to 12 hours in two locations, that being the uh, summer upstaff, which is based out of the Humphrey station, as well as the Argyle location. Those were the two shifts that were in question. So over a two year period being 2021, and then in 2022, they will be adjusted from eight hours uh, in a manner that's going to move them to 10 hours in 2021, which they are right now. They have been moved to that um, once the negotiated settlement was in place. And in 2022, those two shifts will become 12 hour shifts. The Humphrey situation is that that's a fine now finite amount of money that's allocated towards that because it is an upshift so what that does is it reduces the length of time that that shift is in place for ideally the goal has always been to move that shift to a full-time year-round shift which would put 
for the most part, two shifts on on the west side at nights throughout the entire year, because that's not the case currently. Um, so this does move us backwards slightly in that, but we can keep uh, attempting to achieve that goal as our next step in expanding services. In Argyle, it moves the, um, it does increase costs in that that was a full round year um, shift. And so moving it from eight to 12 does increase the cost by 33%. I guess it's 50% actually. Um, and that has to be incorporated into the budget. So uh, we are expecting to be fine in uh, 2021. It is one of the reasons why I'm hesitant with regards to the financial position and being as solid as I, uh, I expect it to be because this is new and is a change and it is a going to be a financial hurdle that we have to cross with regards to the 2022 budget in terms of it going from 10 hours to 12. So uh, just so you're aware of where we stand with that, that is the course of action. That's the negotiated settlement and will be uh, what occurs from a staffing perspective. Questions, comments? No? Okay. May I have a mover and seconder for that resolution? Kathy? Irene? Uh, that the EMS Advisory Committee acknowledges report R&R 12-hour shifts AD 2021 for information purposes. Uh, anyone opposed to the passing of that resolution? Nope, that's carried then. That is everything I have on the agenda unless somebody else has something. No? I just need a mover and seconder for adjournment then. Rod and Scott. Okay. Anyone opposed to adjourning? No. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> I usually no. find no one is. That's for sure. It's a uh, pleasure to be in these meetings. It's fun. Okay, so I'm.